Can you hear me? No, it's not running. Can you hear me now? Yes, excellent. Um, I'm Bjorn Faller. I'm here to talk to you about TypeSafe C++. You're supposed to laugh now, okay? <clears throat> You're supposed to really laugh now. Um, because we all know that C++ is really, really not type safe. If you were at the previous meetup when, when Arvid talked about uh, uh, how the integer types work, you know that there's nothing like type safety anywhere. Um, but what is type safety? Any takers? Any ideas? By the way, this is going to be a really short session if you're not going to talk more. <laughs> so, come up with ideas, ask questions, interrupt at any time. Does anyone have an idea what we mean with type safety? Of course you do. Can I hear some suggestion? Not confusing unrelated entities. Not confusing unrelated entities. Yeah, a little fluffy, but yeah, sure. No implicit typecasting, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I was scouting for a, for a definition, and what I found was this from a Wiktionary. Um, the extent to which a programming language discourages or prevents types, type errors. I think there are some interesting details here. Uh, the word extent seems to indicate that it's not black and white. You have varying degrees of type safety from absolutely no safety whatsoever until something that is very safe. And then you have also discourages or prevents. I guess in C++, since we can always do uh, horrendous type punning via void stars, um, we can forget about prevent. But we can talk about discourages, saying that if we can achieve some mechanism by which it is difficult to get types wrong by mistake, but sure, if you want to go via void pointer, all better off. Um, but then I think we can say that something is type safe. Um, my take on this is we can say that a type safe system prevents or discourages use of one type when another is intended. I guess that's what you were aiming for. Uh, prevents or discourages operations that don't make sense. Um, anyone f familiar with the um, POSIX APIs? Yeah? Which um, operations make sense to make on a file descriptor? Open and close, yeah. Multiply. Square root. Okay. But it, it, a file descriptor is represented by an integer, so of course you can add them um, for whatever good that would do. Um, so that's obviously a case of an API where that, that allows operations that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, use some values outside the defined space. I remember fondly a young teenager learned uh, Pascal programming language. And you can say that this type is an integral type with values between one and six, inclusively, because that's really good if you want to model dice. I actually don't remember what happened if you managed to get it outside its defined space. I think the program terminated, but I'm not sure. Uh, that is one thing that is often forgotten, limiting the legal value space. Maybe because it's difficult to decide what on earth do you want to do when, when you happen to go outside it. Any reflections so far, questions? Uh, this is what I to, intend to talk about today. So 
the introduction you've already been part of. So I intend next to talk about how we can actually achieve some degree of type safety in C++. And then we'll look, I scouted GitHub for uh, open source libraries that provide support for achieving type safety. Uh, there are many, many, many more out there than I'll, I will show. It, it would be a very long and very boring session if we went through all of them. Uh, and in the end, we'll look at what actually happens with your code when you start using strong types. Because things happen when your code when you do that. Uh, and then afterwards, you will change the way you think about programming, actually. But that is after this session, and not part of it. Right, so type safety in C++. Uh, my story begins with uh, a bug that I had. Uh, I developed a, a, a communications protocol. This is nothing like the real code, but the real bug is that we had is here. So I have two types, a request ID and a receiver ID. And the, the thing here is that I want to initiate a request to remove a receiver. So I allocate a request ID and I remove the receiver. And do you see the bug? What is the difference between request ID and receiver ID? Well, that's spelled differently. But that's pretty much it. So at best, this, these ideas are request ID and receiver ID here in the API. They work as a, a documentation, but everybody knows that nobody reads documentation anyway. So it, it doesn't really provide any information. So yeah, that was the bug. And uh, that felt super embarrassing. Um, who here has never ever done that? Okay, so I'm not the only one. Good. Um, what did you do? So, okay, so you fixed the bug and then you continued as if nothing had happened. That's not what I did. Well, actually, that is what I did to begin with. I fixed the bug. Yeah, I did. But uh, I felt that this was so embarrassing that I wanted to explore and see. Can I do something to prevent this type of problem from ever appearing again in our code? So I started thinking, if we have code like this, I have some function that takes a B and it calls another function that takes an A. When is this allowed? Well, it's a trick question because we don't know what A and B are. Uh, here. Yes, this is allowed in C++. I cannot for my life imagine why you would ever want to call a function taking a double with an enum. Totally incomprehensible, but legal C++. So, yeah, sorry, I pulled your leg. C++ is completely unsafe. Thank you for listening. But wait a minute. Now then. Yes? Can we blame Z? Can we blame Z? Um, yeah. Yes, we can blame Z, definitely. <laughs> and, uh, and for C, we can probably blame BCPL or whatever it was called uh, and so on backwards. Um, you may want to, you know, sidetracking a little bit, you may want to watch uh, Oliver Maudol's presentation from uh, NDC Tech Town about the history of C going back way back, ages. Uh, okay, detour, sorry. Um, what can we do if we want to make this work then? Because if we don't do anything, this is, this is illegal. We are not allowed to call a function taking a struct A with a struct B. Reinterpret cast. Reinterpret cast, yes, of course. Um, would you please leave? <laughs> <laughs> Seacast, no. Sorry, I didn't hear. No. 
what we can do, we can say that we want A to be constructible from a B. Yeah, we can do that. But this call won't be allowed if we make the, the constructor explicit. If it is, then we will have to say call other with A constructed from B. No, it's really typesafe. Now we're showing what we're doing. Or we can do the same thing but backwards have a conversion operator. Or we can make A a base class of B. I guess we'd have to swap the order of them, but yeah. Um, and that's pretty much it. So the language actually does provide some pretty strong guarantees uh, about types, just not the built-in integral types that everybody uses everywhere. Uh, so if we take my problematic code, but instead of using these uh, type aliases, I just have a simple struct request ID that ha has a value and a struct receiver ID that has a value. No matching function for call to remove. No known conversion from receiver ID to request ID for first argument. This is about as good as it gets, isn't it? So yeah, I would say that C++ is type safe. Sure, you can circumvent it if you want to, it's not very difficult, but by default, this is not a mistake you will make. So, we have control. By default, nothing is allowed. We explicitly make the things we want to, to work available. We have the power. So, maybe I should do something like this and say, I have a receiver ID that I can initialize with a value, I can get a value from it, but I cannot get an L value reference to it to modify it uh, without having operations to permit it. So, of course, I add some. Uh, sensible operators like a comparison and maybe we want them ordered, I don't know. Um, and in C++17 we have a cool thing. We can say enum class receiver ID that is a U in 32T. And here is where, not Saturday, I had to make a substantial rewrite of my presentation because in a thread on Twitter about this uh, enum class thing, there is Olaf Vage, I'm probably mispronouncing his name, Icelandic is really not my thing, uh, to which Pete Bindles responded, did you just slice an orange into an apple? Um, I obviously had to click the Godbolt link, so it had this code. Enum class orange, enum class apple. We create an orange with value 4, we create an apple with value 3, we create an apple from an orange. Ugh. Yay. A few hours later, Olafur responded, Did I just find a bug in the C standard? Ooh. And it turns out he most probably did. Um, to the best of my knowledge, this is now an, um, on its way of becoming a, a defect report for the standard. But I don't know exactly the state of it. But this means that as it currently stands with C17, I cannot endorse using enum class to get type safe integers, unfortunately. Hopefully, the if, the if it is considered to be a bug in the standard, then this will be forbidden, the compilers will forbid it. Uh, if for whatever unfathomable reason the standards committee decides that no, that is exactly the way we want it, I presume that the compilers will start warning for it. Because that is a dangerous thing with this. There's no warning at all, no matter what you turn on, nothing. Um, 
So for now, this is not as safe as it's meant to be. Yes. Yeah, like Richard Smith says uh, on the right there, uh, this appears to be an oversight in the wording. I don't think we, we intended to allow cases that require an explicit conversion for the enumerations on the lying type. So it, it seems to be that it wasn't meant to be allowed, but it was. We'll see what happens, but uh, at the very least, I assume that compilers will start warning for it, and you do turn on all warnings, and you do consider warnings to be errors, right? Yes. Good. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Is this only if they have the same type? Is this only if they have the same underlying type? I do not know. Sorry, I I haven't checked. Otherwise, it's even worse. No. Yeah, I agree. Um, I I haven't checked. I don't know. Sorry, but it's easy to try it. So back to this. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of boilerplate code here, and then we receive the same boilerplate code for request ID. Questions so far. Yes, Alvin. Isn't it a problem that you have implicit conversions both to Steve and from several? It means you're just digging into something that takes a unit or two without noticing. Um, where, where are you now? Here? No, no. The, oh. You have a, an implicit uh, conversion in a constructor and an implicit. Ah, okay. In, in my example code, yes, you're absolutely right. And that is a bug in my slides. So you're, you're right. Uh, it, it is a problem, uh, if you didn't hear, uh, it is a problem here that this uh, constructor takes an implicit int and we have a conversion operator that, that is also implicit. At least one of these should be explicit, preferably both. Um, yeah, that, that is a, a problem. Other questions? All right. So what I did then, after this uh, trying things out, was to see that it should be possible to make a library that makes it easy to prevent these kind of bugs. Uh, keep in mind that at this time, the only thing I was thinking about was to accidentally swap uh, parameters. There's more to type safety than that, but that was the focus I had at the time. Um, so, what I did was this it's a template, a class template safe type. It takes a t, t is the type we want, so we have a, a value of type t. And then we have a tag. And the tag is not really used for anything other than being there because it's part of the type signature. So, if I have a safe type of int and tag1, and a safe type of int and tag2. They are completely different types. And that is the only role that tag has up there. So we can have this conversion. Again, yes, there should be, um, they should be explicit. Uh, to prevent accidental construction from uh, something with another tag or with uh, another T that is uh, implicitly convertible, you can do this. Uh, a constructor that takes another T and another tag and we delete it. So if you call it with something else, this one will match and say, hey, it's an illegal call. I can't let you do that. And the way you use it then is that I say, my type int1 is a safe type int with struct int1. So I'm actually constructing this tag type in place where I'm using it. And it's not used anywhere else in my system. It's just there to make int from, from int2 because, because it uses a different tag. tag. So going back to my 
failure, embarrassing failure, replace the, the type defs with the safe type that uses uh, the tags to differentiate them, like so. Clear request ID, clear receiver ID, different tags. So these are completely different types now. Same mistake as before. And yes, the compiler caught it. Excellent. There's not a lot of boilerplate for, for the user code. So we get a, a message, compilation error message saying safe type with struct receiver ID tag cannot be converted to a safe type with request ID tag. It's almost ideal. Not quite, but almost. Sorry for interrupting. No, please do interrupt. More. Uh, uh, the, the tag type we hear, this uh, like local internal type, uh, if you're, is that scoped somehow? No. The, the, is the uh, tag type scoped? No, it isn't. It's, uh, it exists in the same scope as uh, everything else, but it's, you, you just use it once. But I'm coming to something a little bit better very soon. Yes? I mean, yes? Part should work. Two, two, how do you intend for tuples to work here? I don't think I understand. Instead of safe type. How? A tuple of U in 32T and another tuple of U in 32T. They are the same type. So I don't think I understand what you mean. You have the tag, the, the tag type. Okay, yeah, okay, I can have the tag. Yeah, okay, I understand now. I can yeah, sure, that's a, a way of implementing them, uh, to, to use a tuple with the, my type and uh, the silly tag. Um, maybe, I'm not sure, maybe. Uh, it's uglier because you don't have the casting uh, operators. Yeah. But what you can do, if we remove this uh, compilation error, we can use the CRTP, the Curiously Recurring Template Pattern. Have you seen that before? Yes. Yes. I forgot to bring my James Complean uh, book. Uh, I forget the name of it. I bought it in 93. Uh, Scott Myers used to call it the LSD book because it's purple and it messes with your mind. Uh, but so I say that request ID is a struct that inherit this inherits safe type of U in 32T and request ID. So request ID is defined in terms of itself. Uh, this is not a problem because struct request ID colon. Now, now request ID is a known name. We don't know what it means, but it's a known name. And then I can use it as the tag field because we don't use the tag for anything other than to disambiguate the types. And then the only thing I say inside it is bring in the constructors of the safe type so that my request ID can be constructed by anything that the safe type can be constructed. And the same for receiver ID. And doing this, I actually get a slightly better compilation error. Actually, I think it's pretty darn good. No known conversion from receiver ID to request ID. Anyone disappointed with that? I think it's pretty darn perfect. Except for the ugly boilerplate code. So I replace that with an even uglier thing, a macro. <laughs> so now the use of code becomes like this. And I'm not super happy about that, to be perfectly honest. But um, no, it works. It solved the problem. So I was happy for a while. I mean, this works. This totally works. But then I wanted to use strings. And this works. But it's cumbersome because I want to... No, wrong tense. I don't want to. I wanted to back then, at the time. I wanted to be able to call member functions on them. And I cannot do that. But I still want the ability to, to catch this mistake. So how do I do that? And I had what I thought was a super brilliant idea. 
I extend my safe type with uh, a boolean parameter that I use uh, type traits to find out if it is possible to inherit from it. And then everything is before. And I have a specialization for when it is possible to inherit from it. And then I actually do. Ha! Huh. Publicly. Bring in using t colon t to, to get the constructor and then this uh, extra templated constructed to make it illegal to construct across compatible safe types. Yay! Everything works. I get exactly the compilation error I want and I think this was a stupid mistake. Any ideas what it was? I'd... What, what's wrong? <laughs> Yes, I'm still implicitly convertible to, to a, a stood string. Uh, I've sort of kind of broken the uh, list of substitution principle, where I'm saying that interface name and also customer name is usable everywhere a string is usable, including functions that modify the string. Not super clever, actually. Uh, so, big mistake, but it did solve the, the problem that I saw in front of me at the time. Uh, it made it convenient to use and impossible to accidentally swap parameters. So, uh, partial win, but major mistake. Reflections, questions? You're completely stunned. Right. I didn't quite get why you don't do a public inheritance. Like when you inherited, you didn't, like you didn't specify so it was private inheritance. Didn't I? The, then I made a mistake. Okay. No, it's a struct. Sorry. It, oh, it's a, oh yeah, right. Sorry. It saves several characters of slide space <laughs> to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's scout GitHub a little bit. There are many libraries that, that intend to solve this kind of problem. I'm not going through them all, but um, two specifically I will go through. Um, this fellow turned up, Jonathan Miller, uh, Funathan on uh, GitHub and Twitter and other places. He introduced a library called TypeSafe, which he markets as a zero overhead utilities for preventing bugs at compile time. What's not to love? Uh, it's quite a rich library. Uh, it, it contains actually much more than just type safety. For example, it contains uh, versions of, of uh, std option and std variant that are arguably better than the standard versions. Uh, there are other things in there too. Uh, so I think maybe the description of the library could be changed to say what it does. Uh, this was introduced in uh, October 2016, and I'm, I'm really surprised that it is, wasn't longer ago. Um, when I saw this library, I was completely blown away uh, because he thought about some things that I had not thought about at that time. So. You have the GitHub link uh, at the top. Uh, in TypeSafe, you have a strong type def, that's his name of it. Uh, and the public interface of a strong type def is just the constructors uh, and uh, access operators, and everything is const expert, everything is uh, explicit. Super good. Uh, the way you use it is you include TypeSafe strong type def, and you probably want to do a, an alias for the uh, namespace. Everything is in namespace TypeSafe. And you use it in a way that probably looks a little bit familiar. My handle is TypeSafe strong type def, my handle int. Okay, so reverse the order of the type parameters, but it's the same idea obviously, and you bring in the constructors from strong type def. 
And what you have now is truly something that is a handle. The only thing you can do with this is store a value in it and retrieve it. Nothing else. But then comes a clever bit that I had not thought about. You can inherit functionality and say, no, but I want my handle to have uh, equality comparison. I want to check if this handle is the same as that handle or not. Because that makes sense to do, often. Not always, for all types. And maybe I want a, um, a stream insertion operator. So, why not? That is cool. And he also provides in his library some higher level uh, kind of operation support. So, for example, we can say that we want this to be integer arithmetic. Um, this probably sounds like a, a weird thing to say, but it, you will understand later. Uh, in my explorations of uh, strong type def like constructions, I have not once in my code had a need for integer, integer arithmetic. Not once. Um, maybe my code base is weird, I don't know, but that's what I have. You don't work with units. Pardon me? You don't work with units. I don't work with units. Uh, units are not uh, arithmetic types. Um, we'll, we'll get back to that in a while. Uh, because if you multiply two instances of a unit, you don't get the same type back, you get another type. Whereas if you multiply two arithmetic types, you get the same type back. Uh, so units is, are, are very interesting, but they are not arithmetic. Uh, you can, of course, if you want to provide your own O-stream insertion operator instead, so you can use static cost to, to, to trigger these uh, explicit conversion operators, get the underlying value and print it out. Uh, so now we're back in this land where you obviously can make mistakes if you want to, but a static cost to get the underlying value and shove something unrelated into it sort of sticks out in your code. But of course, why make things stick out when you can do a type safe get instead? But get has the advantage that it does the right thing regardless of constant volatile and R-value references and L-value references and all permutations thereof. So um, I guess there are reasons to use it, but it's also maybe a little bit too convenient to get the underlying value and have access to modifying it. But I thought this was super cool. Is there anything in there to get the string functionality back? Uh, I, I don't think so. Um, I'm not sure, but I don't think so. So get gives you the value? Yes. It? Now it's, uh, it, it, if you have an L-value reference, you get an L-value reference of the underlying value. If you have a const R-value reference, you get the bizarre const R-value reference of the underlying value. That's how it works, um, for better and for worse. Can switch to another library. Um, Jonathan Bokara, uh, this was, this I actually know, this was in August last year. That, that was at least when I noticed his library. He calls it named type. Uh, you can read a lot about the, how to use name type and stuff in his uh, blog, Fluent C++. If you're not reading it, you should really do so, because it, there are many interesting ideas in there. Uh, Jonathan Bakara's name type is uh, a much smaller library than, than Jonathan Miller's. Note that all uh, authors are named Jonathan. Uh, I don't think that is important, but uh, so it has a, a simpler aim. It doesn't try to do quite as much, um, but it's, I think, a little bit easier to use. 
But it also has some interesting things like uh, being able to to do scaling conversions between types of, of the same kind. For example, converting length, length in meters to length in feet if for whatever reason you want to do that. And also nonlinear ones like uh, he mentions watts to decibels or linear frequency scale to octaves and such, which depending on what kind of work you do can, can be interesting. Uh, he held a presentation at meeting C++ called Strong Types for Strong, Strong Interfaces for Strong Types. Um, or was it the other way around? Um, if you haven't watched it, do so. Um, take a photo of that link and uh, go and watch it when you get home. It's a super good presentation. You all done? Okay. So, superficially, nothing new. Uh, you have the GitHub link at the top. You include named type.hpp and you use it as before. Uh, here, everything in this library is in the namespace fluent. So, you say, my handle is a name type int struct my handle tag. Looks familiar. And then you can add to the template parameter list. Uh, he, he calls them skills, but it's a, the kind of functionality that you want. Are they comparable? His skills are, on a, generally speaking, on a higher level than, than John von Miller's. Are they comparable? Are they printable? Are they hashable? You decide what you want to use. And just by having these in the template parameter list means that it's, it's slightly less repetition. With uh, Jonathan Miller's library, you had to repeat the, your type in, in all the skills that you inherited. But on the other hand, a possible advantage with Jonathan Miller's is that uh, being more fine-grained, you can select and pick and choose your details more as you wish. You can, of course, also use the curiously recurring template pattern, uh, which is useful if you want to add your own member functions uh, in the type. Here's an interesting thing. The syntax is not the greatest, but I think that's good. You can say that I actually want my handle to be implicitly convertible to int. No. Temple, it's a, it's complicated. <laughs> it's, a, it's an artifact of how the library is designed. A slightly different design would, uh, would take that away. But the thing is that these no, I, I don't remember. I have to look up the, the code. Um, so for, for fear of uh, saying the wrong thing, uh, I will just not say more. Uh, it's, but it, it's a language reason together with the, the, how, how the library is designed that, that causes this. I'm not entirely comfortable with uh, allowing implicit conversions, but at least you are explicit that you want things to be implicit. So, I guess that is good. Um, so, questions on these two libraries. I'm not going to go through others. There are others. What are the requirements on the other type? Does that have to do something symmetric? Like convertible from whatever? Which uh, other type do you mean? Do you so here you had yeah. So if you have okay. Some other type, yeah. Like you must be able to, well, implicitly convert your internal type 
the underlying type of your strong type. It must be implicitly convertible to the type you want. So if you would say that I want it to be implicitly convertible to, I don't know, a string, you cannot implicitly com construct a string from an int, so it will fail. So that, that is the rule. But you could say uh, a C style enum, just to be horrible, or um, a double, or a bool, which maybe makes sense. Pardon me? Void Implicitly convertible to void pointer, excellent. Um, uh, no. H haven't you gone yet? <laughs> okay. So what does strong types do with your code when you start using them? Because they do things with your code. So I'm going to let you in on um, some secrets from my job. Uh, I work for NetInsight. We develop networking equipment and one of the things we are good at is to keep track of where network capacity is used so that you don't accidentally overcommit network capacity anywhere. And we do that, actually this is not secret at all, it's in uh, various patents and uh, standards documents. Uh, we have something we call a slot, which is a, a quanta of network capacity, never mind what it actually represents, but it's a, it's a slot. And we bundle slots together in frames, where you have slot numbers. Yeah. So we have an example here of uh, a frame with 24 slots. In, in reality, there are tenth of, tenths of thousands of uh, slots in a frame, but the uh, Presentation becomes a bit unwieldy if I try to draw that. Uh, the colors here are to denote data flows in the network. So we have a green data flow and a blue data flow. Uh, and we have some interesting things here. So we, we, have, we keep track of the slot count. We see that the green data flow has eight slots and the blue data, blue stream ha has three data slots. We can say that the white is free available capacity, so we can allocate another 13 slots more. And in the source code, this is represented like so. Not really big. I, I really wish that we could use, let's say, type name and a name to, to forward declare a type without having to bother with explaining if it is a, a struct or if it is an enum or whatever, but I'm sorry we can't, but this is pseudocode. So I introduce a name slot index. Slot index is the numbers and slot count. And then to the right we have a slot range saying that we have a range starting at slot 13 and four more slots. So that is the rightmost green fragment in the frame. So these are the entities I'm juggling with in my daytime job. And magic numbers. Who has magic numbers in their code? So I had some code like this. So available capacity is zero. Okay, that it sort of makes sense. You can read it, you can understand it. But Maybe it is better to say if it is slot count zero. Because now it's not a, just a magic number. It's a magic number with the semantics. It has type. It means something. It's not just zero. Zero can be anything. It can be null pointer. Right? Um, but now it's a slot count of zero. And this is unwieldy to type, so you actually give it a name. So now, now you don't have magic numbers anymore. So just by, just by introducing strong types in your code base, you, you start to get rid of magic numbers because they're, they're, they're so unwieldy to deal with. So you, you more or less feel forced to give things names. And this is good. It, it improves your code readability. It, it improves intent. Another thing is encapsulation. When everything was a type def, you cannot 
do much with it. You, you cannot overload functions on different type depths of int. Doesn't make sense because they're all int. So I had some code that looked sort of kind of like this. I have a, it's a communications protocol. I have a message buffer and I want to serialize my slot count uh, into the buffer. And it's a binary protocol, so they serialize as 24 bits. And this occurred in four, I think, places in the code. This is open for mistakes. What if one of them actually said 23 bits instead of 24? Whoa. That bug would be fun, fun to find out. And it's redundant. Don't repeat yourself. So this is just bad. You don't, don't write code like this. But when you have a strong type def, then slot count is a type of its own, different from other strong types that are also uh, on uin32. So I can write a function serialize that takes a message buffer and the slot count. And this will only be callable with a slot count. It will not be callable with a slot index or, I don't know, whatever. Even a, a, an int, it will not be callable with. So now I have centralized knowledge that slot counts are serialized as 24 bits in one place. And that is good. And then we can do details to make it more C++. Maybe we say that serialize is the thing, the way to do it. So I have a template that defaults to being deleted and I need to forward declare message buff for that, but never mind. And I have a templated function in message buff that calls this global serialize. So I can just say, in my message buffer, serialize the capacity, which is a slot count. This is good. It's much easier to read. And I've centralized the knowledge of how to serialize slot counts in one place. So, even though I haven't done much about what a slot count actually means, just, just having it as a type of its own means that I can overload functions and I can do this information hiding. This is good. Now we come to something. Does this increase the, the size of the, the bug build or slot count with names and stuff like that? Does it increase the size of uh, the bug builds with names, etc.? Yes, it does. Yep. Your symbols become longer. And um, depending, this may or may not be an issue. Uh, if, if you have a large shared library with this in, in, the, uh, in the published API, then obviously the shared library will be larger because you have longer symbol names. Will there be a speed penalty? I thought you'd never ask. What took you so long? Okay, so I have a really stripped down safe type here, but you, you recognize it. Safe type with the tag constructor, the deleted constructed to, to ban cross initialization. Uh, I added some operators to it. Well, what happened there? So we have three safe types here, int1, int2, int3. This is super difficult because I'm not having that picture on my screen here. So, uh, so we have a, I can scroll up a little bit so it's easier to see in the back maybe. I have a function func that, call, that takes two of these safe types and calls consume on an int that we get from adding them. So, okay, this is a stupid example. It's not super type safe. Where do I have my pointer? Here. What about the overhead in terms of performance? Uh, 
I don't think there is any. But yeah, you're right about the, the names. Uh, oh no. What did I do? What did I do? What did I do? Local, local host. Uh, so. You're working with network, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, why I, I, I don't trust networks. They're, they're, they're evil. Yeah, that's what I did. But uh, my local, locally compiled uh, uh, compiler explorer isn't running. <laughs> that's why. That's the problem. So. Okay, let's see if this works better now. Yay. So with the demangle, you see that we have a fairly long name. We do. But you also asked, interesting that I've got another typeface, one with serifs. Yeah. Oh. I have two other function versions here. I have a... This is so problematic. Um, yeah, I guess we can call that working. Okay, so I have a, a safe type, safe func that takes these uh, safe type int1, int2, int3, and a by reference. And I'll do a simple thing. Plus equals, minus equals. And I have the same with the primitive types. So they're all just type defs for int. Look at the assembly. The safe type. Move, add, sub, move, return. The one but primitive. Move, add, move, sub, move. Huh? What happened here? Aliasing. Aliasing, exactly. The rules of the C++ language says that references or pointers of unrelated types may not represent the same object. Therefore, it knows that adding to i1 cannot possibly change the value of i3. But when we're working with uh, the raw integers, it cannot make such guarantees, so it will lay out code that will work and do the correct thing if it is. So we have a negative cost uh, solution here. That is cool. Uh, granted, uh, this was actually a difficult <laughs> example to come up with, <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it's not always uh, like that, but it can be. But uh, yeah, performance. Um, normally, it doesn't cost anything. There are agreed, uh, obscure, but there are situations where you can actually gain performance. Question. Yes? Um, then, you get then, then you will get aliasing anyway, yes, that is true, if, if you have, sorry you didn't hear, I guess, uh, it, if, you, if the underlying type is actually a, a reference, then this doesn't work, and that is correct. I haven't measured the compile time overhead, but there is obviously a cost in compile time, definitely. So. What you're paying is uh, compile time and uh, size of your binaries. And 
with the extended uh, symbol lengths, you also get longer link times because it takes a little bit longer to, to look up the symbols. Um, so, yeah, nothing is free, but um, I would say you, you, you get something quite good for not a horrendous cost. So, yes, ah, this is so difficult. Oh no, this is bad. Okay. Um, yeah, we've seen that, seen that, seen that, seen that. Questions? I should have done this it get so much faster. I could do, do the entire presentation in five minutes. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say that um, at work we still use my primitive first version. Uh, I have also on GitHub and uh, such a library, but it's uh, I, I consider it to be very experimental. So please look at it, please contribute to it, but don't look, use it in uh, production. Please don't. You will be sorry. Um, Okay, type semantics. We haven't talked about semantics. Only that I briefly mentioned that I have never in my code base seen a use for arithmetic types. So I had some other code. I have a slot pool and a, a cache the number of uh, unused slots because that's a good thing to have. So I have a function release capacity takes a vector of slot ranges and just sum them. But this doesn't work because I have no operator plus equal for slot counts. So this made me at first a bit grumpy. But then I started thinking, wait a minute, what operations make sense to use on the slot count. Hmm. Okay, so let's have a look. Does it make sense to add a slot count? Well, I did in the previous slide, so that's a no-brainer. And we want added slot counts to become slot counts. So yeah, I have some capacity, I have some capacity more. I have more total capacity. That makes perfect sense. Does it make sense to subtract them? Yes. Multiply them. Well, I guess maybe in some places it could, but not in my problem domain. So for me, no, we won't do that. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense to scale them. I have this slot count, I want three times as much. Oh. Yeah, sure, why not? Uh, divide slot counts. Yeah, I think it does, because it, if I said this count is three times as much as that, that, then I should be able to divide them and get three. And obviously I should then also be able to divide them with a ratio. So this makes sense. Slot indices then. The slot indices are the numbers in the frame. Does it make sense to add slot indices? No. no. Not, not in my problem domain, anyway. Slot index plus slot count. Yes, that makes sense. That's how you represent the, uh, a range. So if you have the rightmost green range, that is slot 13 <clears throat> plus four slots. So the first free slot is slot index 17. So yeah, that makes sense. So it becomes a new slot index. Subtract slot indexes. Yes. yes, of course it does. So we get a slot count. Divide slot indexes. I have no idea what that would mean, so do just remove it. Divide a slot index with a slot count. I have no idea what that would mean either. Divide it with a ratio. Yeah. Oh. 
Multiply slotting, the slotting index squared. No. Slotting index slot times slot count. No, 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 the, the horror. Or ratio. No, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make sense. So, this is interesting. We have some, a subset of arithmetic operations that makes sense. And there is a duality between two types that interact with each other. Uh -huh. uh, I did not know, but I was not very surprised to find out that in mathematics there is a, a term for this. It's an, this is an affine geometry. Uh, the typical example is uh, coordinates in a coordinate system. So the right hand side is the coordinates that denotes positions, exact positions in the coordinate system. And if you subtract them, you get a vector. This is the left hand side. It makes sense to scale vectors. It makes sense to add vectors. It makes sense to add a vector to a coordinate to get another coordinate. And this is actually the same thing, but we have reduced it to only one dimension. There is an excellent example of this in the uh, standard library. Anyone recognize it? Pointer arithmetic, uh, close. What is, because you have pointer and pointer in an array and you subtract them and what do you get? Yes, but what is the difference type? PTR diff. What is PTR diff? It's an, in, it's an integral primitive. So you can multiply them, doesn't make sense. Sorry, yes? Pardon, can I? Just I, I'm sorry, I don't think I follow. Can you repeat? You have taken away multiplication, correct? Yeah. Uh, but you have allowed division. Yes. What happens if you take slot count divided by parentheses, slot count which is initialized with one, yeah. and then divided by the slot count again, you will implicitly define multiplication. Uh, no, because then I get a different type. Slot count divided by slot count is a ratio, so that, that's just a number. So it's, uh, this slot count is, is three times as big as this one, so it's just a three. And then you cannot divide three by a slot count because that doesn't make sense. So, cool. Uh, what I'm thinking about here in the one-dimensional affine geometry is uh, the standard chrono library. Where the right-hand side is the time points. There are exact moments in time. You can subtract them and then you get a duration. That is here. You can add durations, you can subtract durations, you can divide durations with durations and get a ratio. Curiously, you cannot multiply durations because it's not a physics library. If you have a physics library, of course, second squared makes sense. But in, in this context, as provided in the chrono world, it doesn't make sense. So you cannot do these. Um, but I agree, Paul, with uh, pointers and PTR diff t. They are so close to being there. So close. If, if it was just a better type for, for PTR diff t, one that is better suited to, to uh, mean a, a consecutive range. But this was, uh, for me, actually a, a revelation. I had not previously thought about how, how types relate to each other like this, where some operations make sense, but they change the type to something else. So this is not an, an uh, integer arithmetic type. None of these are. But together, they build a system. And test code. Uh, most of my tests are example-based tests. So you can have tests like this where you 
you create something with uh, explicit numbers. You, you set up expectations. You do something to check that the expectations are fulfilled. And now suddenly this code is a little bit confusing. Okay, we know that in this problem domain that capacity is almost certainly slot counts. But then we have these request IDs. Is, is this throttle capacity, is it throttled to five slots with request ID four or is it the other way around? I don't know. Uh, we can of course give the request a, a name, then it makes sense. Then it's easier to read, good. And then we have all heard that magic numbers like five and eight and two and three are super bad, so we don't do that, we give them names. For the love of everything that is sacred, do not write code like that. It's completely incomprehensible. It doesn't make any sense to any reader. It's super difficult to read code, even in this super tiny example. Don't do that. I think that example-based tests, they are typically small, and it's typically easier to read them with raw numbers or whatever, but give them meaning. Say that it is slot count of five, it is slot count of eight, because now it's possible to read and reason about and say that, okay, I'm throttling the capacity to five slots. It makes sense to expect the clients to have to be reduced to something that sums up to five, two and three in this case. And five and eight initially, yeah, maybe that is a fair scaling. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense. We can reason about the correctness because it's easy to read the code. And then we can go all fancy and do um, user-defined literals for slots because, hey, it's cool, it's available, and do like that. Personally, I think this is uh, cuteness for the sake of cuteness. I prefer the explicit ones. All right. So I think I just dropped the off the edge of the agenda. Are there questions of this analysis of uh, what happens to your source code? Yeah. Well, I'm uh, thinking of the testing. Yeah. So you just demonstrated how the compiler catches you when you're doing mistakes. Yes. So when you're testing your types, that it's actually what you promised is actually yeah. true. Static assert is your friend when it comes to negative testing of, of safe types. Yeah. Yes. So it's possible to run everything with static asserts. Yeah, we, at least in terms of the which operations are allowed and which are not. And for those that are not allowed, you don't really have to check their what they do. You just see that no, they aren't allowed. It doesn't compile. But for those that do compile, you you want to check that they do the expected thing. But the negative testing of, uh, of uh, operations, that, operations are that are not allowed is, allowed is static, uh, assert. static assert. Saying this, does, Saying not this does not compile. Okay, okay. So, to sum up. so to sum up, for the built-in types, there's no doubt about it. The, the type safety is completely abysmal. It's a, it, no, it's not abysmal, it's a joke. It's humor. Uh, but for structs and classes, by default, nothing is allowed. So you add the functionality that you want. So it's your responsibility to add only as much as you need. And I showed you some examples of libraries that makes this uh, a little bit easier. You can obviously roll your own. Uh, I would like to see some really good library that has it all, but I guess well, one can dream. Uh, Thinking about your types, which operations make sense, which operations don't, are oh, super good. Not only for your type design, also for your understanding of your own problem. So do that. And strong types can help make your code more expressive. You, you, you're forced to show intent. And it helps you encapsulate. 
and it helps you actually write sensible tests with magic numbers, but they are magic numbers with uh, semantic meaning. And be wary of type def. And that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, Gustav? Um, you know, there are any uh, intentions of adding something like this to the standard library? My understanding is the, the question is if there is uh, any intention to add something like this to the standard. Uh, my understanding is that there is not. Um, I think the uh, idea is, well, sh show us the code and if it's good enough. <laughs> so feel free to contribute and uh, actually I'm volunteering to help. Um, other questions? I, I have an observation. That, yes. Uh, I find if you have a rule of thumb of never naming your uh, parameters when you declare a function and they don't make sense, you should have better types. That is an excellent observation. Did you hear what he said? If you take your type, your function signatures, and you remove the the name of the parameters, you just see the type, the types of the parameters. If you then cannot understand what the function does or in, in which, what, what they mean, you don't have the right types. There is a caveat there, and that is you can get very good types with type defs, and it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, also my observation, but I never remember about from Stefan Stefan of an nine because he said to take an integer and make calculations fast, take yes. an integer, put it in a struct and it's fact for something slower. And I'm a little bit surprised about this yeah. compile explorer example. Yeah. The other thing is if we want the acceptance of this, we need more test results rather than anything timings types when you use them for recalculations and it's something different if I use an index type. Then I don't need to think if it's an integer or answer an integer. It's an index type and it can have a, kind of a no position. And if I use the units and calculations, so you need more public available tests. Yes. Because otherwise, yeah. the very soon come to people that talk about no, it's performance and fulfill our application. Mm -hmm. So this is important. Okay, I will not, inter not repeat every word of that. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, Harold's uh, observation was that he, he had seen talks mentioning that uh, doing arithmetic on, on the naked integers is much is fast, and if you stuck them stick them into a struct, it, there's a performance penalty. And I showed you that that is not the case. And uh, I don't know, I haven't heard that, uh, but uh, I take your word for it. Um, but I think. What Harold also observed was that maybe we need to, to have public, publicly available data of this. What, what is the performance? What does it cost? There is obviously, a, like I mentioned, the, there's a compile time cost, there's a link time cost, there's a binary size cost, at least for debug builds and for shared libraries. Um, but I have not seen uh, any place where you get a, a runtime performance penalty. And although I had to work for it, I could show the a performance gain. Um, you, you had a construct to the arguments. Yeah. Uh, what if you would not have a construct and a value? Okay. Uh, Maybe that could change. The observation was that I, I used constructs for, for two of the arguments and uh, not the third. No. Uh, it doesn't make any difference at all. Uh, it's exactly the same. Yes? Maybe in the optimization level you're dealing with, uh, it's like this, but it's, I think, actually arithmetic that allows uh, both codes to be compatible or competitive. Uh, for, uh, for floating point numbers, maybe, I don't know. Like yeah. Type of yeah. Uh, what I'm saying is that you should not expect a performance cost. You may, if you're super lucky, get a performance gain, but don't expect that. Isn't there a risk of like uh, going over some limit on the inlining 
pressure? Is there a risk of going over the limit of inlining pressure? Probably. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen that, but, but I take it as likely. Uh, again, I guess the thing to do is try to figure out a way to, to measure it. Yeah. Okay, according to my clock, it's time to say goodbye for now. <laughs> Thank you.